All right, everybody, welcome. Thank you for being here. I'm Ben Powell, the Executive Director of the Free Market Institute here at Texas Tech. I'm quite pleased to see some of you here in person. Uh, I'm pleased that others are able to join us virtually. Uh, I think this might be the first non-class event of any sort with public attendance at Texas Tech since March. Uh, so I really appreciate those of you who are here. I know it doesn't feel like our normal events that have far more people in person than this, um, but uh, hopefully we'll be back to normal on that soon. In the interim, I appreciate those of you who are here and those who are there. Um, with that said, our next event will be coming in early October, and hopefully we'll be trending even more towards normal. Uh, it'll feature Brian Kaplan on Monday, October 5th, and it'll be a, a talk on immigration in his new book on that, uh, which is a graphic novel, uh, which when I first heard, I said, that sounds very unlike Brian, because I thought that meant it was like, you know, off color. A trick note means it's illustrated. Uh, so not exactly what I was thinking. Uh, but today's event, I'm very happy to have you all here for, for Marion Tupi. Mary is a senior fellow with the Cato Center for Global Liberty and Prosperity and the editor of humanprogress.org. He specializes in globalization and global well-being and the politics and economics of Europe and Southern Africa. He received his BA in International Relations and Classics from the University of Witwatersrand or something like that. Witwatersrand. I got the Vs, but it's still mispronounced. In Johannesburg, South Africa, and his PhD in International Relations from the University of St. Andrews in Great Britain. That one's easier. Uh, his articles have appeared in the Financial Times, the Washington Post, the Wall Street Journal, and numerous other outlets. He's appeared on a bunch of TV shows, including BBC, CNN, MSNBC, Fox News, and a bunch of other channels as well. And his topic is related to his most recent book that is 10 days, 11 days old now, uh, that he is co-author of, ten, 10, this book here, 10 Global Trends That Every Smart Person Needs to Know, and many other trends that you will find interesting. Not subtitle, also should include many global trends that every not smart person should also know. Uh, but he's here to talk to you smart ones tonight. Uh, please welcome Mary. Oh, thank you very much. I forgot to say one other thing, because I got this in my hand. We also have a few signed books from here. <clears throat> First, four people who ask questions get a free book. All right, now you go. Thank you very much, Ben. Uh, ben is a brilliant guy, but his Dutch is a little rusty. Uh, it's a university with Vatus around in Johannesburg, South Africa. It was a very good school when I went there, not so much now, but uh, you know, things go up and down, uh, just like life itself. Uh, we are going through some tough times, and um, it is for that reason that I'm even more pleased that some of you uh, have decided to join us today. Um, the talk is not going to be about how the world is a perfect place, but it is going to be a talk about how the world is a much better place uh, than it used to be, and why we can look toward the future uh, with uh, rational optimism, there have been astonishing challenges that humanity has overcome before, and uh, I think there are reasons to believe that we shall overcome them again in the future. So the title of my talk is Most Things Are Getting Better, Yet People Remain Pessimistic. And uh, I run an outfit called Human Progress, so I think the first thing to do um, uh, is to really decide or uh, determine what progress is. And uh, this particular definition of progress comes from the Oxford English Dictionary, and it says that progress is an advancement to a further or higher stage, development usually to a better state or condition, improvement applied especially to manifestations of social and economic change or reform. So then the question obviously becomes, is there evidence for human progress as I have defined it? On this chart you will see life expectancy at birth starting 12,000 years ago at the time of the, of, the, of the agricultural revolution going all the way to the present. And as you can see, life expectancy stayed pretty much the same on a level around uh, 
25 to 30 years, and then suddenly it showed up. So it was the same level 20, uh, 12,000 years ago. It was the same level when the first um, city was founded by humanity, the city of Uruk. It was the same at the time of Jesus or, or Caesar Augustus. Then, during the Enlightenment and uh, during the Scientific Revolution, it really started taking off in Europe due to a variety of improvements um, in uh, sanitation, in uh, medical knowledge, and so on and so forth. Um, but really, it's only in the last uh, 100 years or so that we have seen a tremendous increase in life expectancy. Today, life expectancy is 72 years globally. It is 80 years in the West, and it is about 88 years in Japan. So as you can see on this chart, Europe and North America, which is to say the orange and the green line, have entered the um, 19th century already well ahead of the pack. But it is really during the Industrial Revolution um, that a massive gap opens between the countries that uh, industrialize, that generate a lot of wealth, can invest it in uh, sanitary infrastructure, better food, and so forth. Uh, and a massive gap opens between the West and the rest. But of course, that gap has been shrinking. In uh, the 1960s, the gap was about 23 years between developed and developing world, and that gap had shrunk to about eight years in uh, 2017. Now, one of the reasons for the improvement in uh, life expectancy around the world is a dramatic decline in child mortality. And that is true even of the poorest continent in the world, which is Sub-Saharan Africa where the mortality rate is roughly, uh, of children under five, is right, roughly where it was in 1930. And as you can see here, the, um, the slope is becoming uh, ever steeper. And what that really means is that um, it is becoming easier uh, to prevent unnecessary deaths of children uh, around the world. As you can see uh, through the Swedish example, it took a really long time to get down to low levels of child mortality, but Africa, the Caribbean, South Asia, and other places have done so in a record time. So this is uh, another look at uh, the, the same charts, and, and as you can see, the, the gap in child mortality has shrunk from 135 babies between the developed and developing countries to 33 uh, in a scope of, what, 50 years. So that's a very dramatic improvement in poor countries. Let's look at uh, GDP per person uh, per day. And this, once again, goes back to 12,000 years ago, uh, all the way to the present. And as you can see, GDP per capita per day uh, remained pretty much the same uh, for about, uh, well, for close to 12,000 years. Uh, it was about $2 per person per day in 2011 dollars. Then, in 18th century, by the time of the 18th century, it rose to $2.80. So we are already beginning to see a, a, an increase. But consider the following. Um, today, GDP per person per day is $40. Okay? So, in the 1800 years, 18 centuries, which separated uh, the notional birth of Christ, or the emperorship of Caesar Augustus, and the presidency of Thomas Jefferson, GDP per capita rose by 40 percent. Between 1800 and 1900, it rose by 80 percent, which is to say that over the course of one century, uh, between the presidency of uh, Thomas Jefferson and the presidency of uh, who was in charge in uh, 1900, was it uh, Theodore Theodor Roosevelt? Um, in uh, uh, over that period of time. GDP per person per day had increased twice as much as in the previous 18 centuries combined. And that's the effect of 
Industrial Revolution has spread from Western Europe and from Britain specifically to North America and produced uh, the, the prosperity or began to produce the prosperity which we enjoy today. One other thing, over the last 100 years the global economy grew roughly at a rate of 1.8% per year. If that growth continues until 2100, which is to say for the next 80 years, the average global GDP per person per day will be $166. It will be over $600 in the United States. Okay? That's absolutely remarkable that uh, in today's dollars, um, an average person will be making close to 200 bucks a day. That's if we keep growth going at the rates that we have experienced over the last 100 years. Now, in terms of absolute numbers, the gap between developed and developing countries has grown from $9,000 to about $33,000. So that may seem like a huge gap opening between the poor and the rich in the world. However, now we have to translate it into a share of income. So, compared to, so, so the one way to look at this chart is to say that people in developing countries were making on average 16% of how much people in developed countries were making <coughs> in, 19, in the early 1950s. But by 2019, that grew to 29%. In other words, over the last 70 years or so, the share of income uh, in developing countries has risen from 16% of the kind of money that we make here in, the, in, in, de in developed countries, in rich countries, to 29%. So that is obviously a close to a doubling and a tremendous improvement. So not surprisingly, due to the increases in income in developing countries, in poor countries, we have also seen a dramatic decline in poverty, in absolute poverty. Not relative poverty, but absolute poverty, which is measured by uh, $2 per person per day. So about 200 years ago, 9 out of 10 people living on Earth, again, think about Thomas Jefferson's presidency, 9 out of 10 people in the world lived in absolute poverty. They survived on less than two dollars a day. Today, that number is 7.6 percent. Uh, okay? In the last 20 years, that's the dotted line, in the last 20 years, since the beginning of the millennium, the share of the people living in absolute poverty on less than two dollars a day shrank shrunk from 29% to less than 8%. This is what the Brookings Institution has called the greatest and fastest reduction in poverty in world history, and it, indeed it is true. Some of you may be uh, older than 20, and uh, so during your lifetime, um, this is an extraordinary achievement. In this chart, you see uh, not the percentages, but the absolute number of people who are living in, 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 in poverty. And what you can see uh, is, is the yellow bit, and that's sub-Saharan Africa. Now, what that shows you, really, is that absolute poverty has now pretty much disappeared from the rest of the world and is now increasingly focused or increasingly concentrated in sub-Saharan Africa. You will also see that the yellow bit is more or less flatlining. And that could give you an impression that there isn't much progress happening in Sub-Saharan Africa and not much progress expected to happen in Sub-Saharan Africa. But that would be quite wrong. And that's because Sub-Saharan Africa is the only place in the world where population is still increasing at a rapid click. So today, there is about 1 billion people living in Sub-Saharan Africa. But by 2030, in 10 years time, 1.4 billion people will live in Sub-Saharan Africa. And that means that even though the absolute number of people in absolute poverty is going to remain the same, the share of the sub-Saharan population in absolute poverty will shrink from about 40% to 30%. Now, astonishingly, 
we are making more money while working less. Uh, in 1830, uh, the typical work week in Western countries was 70 hours, today it's 40 hours. And the overall number of hours continues to decline. This chart shows you what happened to the number of hours worked uh, in the United States between 1950 and today. It shrunk by 11%. Uh, it shrunk by 21% in rich countries, the OECD countries. And um, the reason why I included South Korea is because it shows you what happens to number of hours worked as country undergoes industrialization, as it undergoes economic development. So in 1950, South Korea was as poor as Ghana. It was an incredibly backward, uh, economically backward place. It had no industry. But in the 60s and the 70s, um, South Korea started to open its economy. It started to really join the global economy. It had an export-driven economic growth. And as that happened, people started to put in more and more hours uh, into, uh, 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 of, of work because, of course, they were beginning to get more compensated for their labor, and so they wanted to make uh, as much money as possible. And then at some point, uh, they decided, well, we are making a lot of money, and we are now going to, we are now rich, so let us try to prioritize other things, like spending time with our family, maybe taking more vacations, and so on. And then, once, once South Korea really reaches peak industrialization, then the number of working hours starts to decline, and it's the same thing that we see in, in other um, uh, countries. First you see a peak and then a decline as people who are rich start to prioritize other things than work. In this chart you see a, multi or a multiplier of items that you can buy for the same amount of labor. So these are commonly used appliances and household goods in the United States of America. These are not prices in dollars. These are prices in, 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 in amount of work. So think about it this way. The longest blue bar is color TV um, and uh, at the end of the bar you have a, you have a number which says 14.66, let's call it 15. What that tells you is that if you had to put in 10 hours of work to buy one TV in 1970, you could get 15 TVs for the same amount of labor in 2019. Okay? So these are the multipliers of the appliances that you can buy for the same amount of labor. I, I hope that's clear, but if it's not, I'm happy to return to it in uh, Q&A. That, of course, doesn't mean that everything got cheaper in America, and again, we can talk about it in the Q&A. But the things where the market is permitted to operate well, where you have a lot of competition, such as in production and uh, sale of appliances, uh, things have really uh, become very cheap indeed. In this chart, you have a years of schooling going back all the way to 1870. Um, so back then, the glo on global average, a child could expect to receive 0 0.5 years of education in his or her lifetime. Again, in 1870, globally, um, a child could expect to be taught for half a year in her entire lifetime. By 2010, that increased to close to 9 years, so 18 times as much. And here you can see the breakdown of different levels of education. So, obviously, the total is close to nine years. Um, primary education, secondary education, tertiary education still have some, some ways to go. But the point is that throughout the world, people are getting educated more. Here is a uh, global literacy rate, uh, which currently stands at uh, 85%. And in uh, Sub Saharan Sub-Saharan Africa, it stands at 66%, which is roughly where France was in 1870. So, 85% um, of the world can read. In Sub-Saharan Africa, it's two-thirds of the people who live there. Um, 
and, and the comparison with France will give you a sense of how fast that progression has been made. Um, once again, consider the extraordinary uh, uh, angle at which uh, Africa is growing as opposed, to, as opposed to France, which obviously took a much longer time to get to the same place. Um, this is homicides per 100,000 people in five Western European countries at the time of uh, Leonardo da Vinci in, uh, at, the turn of the 16th at the turn of the 16th century. Um, or would that be a turn of the 15th century? I guess that's the fifth turn of the 15th century. Roughly 73 out of 100,000 Italians could expect to be murdered in their lifetimes. Today that number is 0 0.9. And we have seen similar declines uh, throughout much of the world. Though, though not everywhere, but much of the world. This shows you a massive decline in uh, warfare around the world since the collapse of communism. As you can see, the dotted line marks uh, the collapse of communism and wars were very, very high indeed. And all of those have now come down. The blue line um, denotes uh, civil conflicts, civil wars. Um, yellow line is the total, and uh, orange line is interstate warfare, which really means one country declaring war on another and then sending their armies across borders. And those have pretty much disappeared, which is why the blue and the, uh, and the yellow line are now joined, because what that really means is that all the conflicts in the world are pretty much now civil wars. The, 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 uh, the intensity of conflict has also declined. These are number of deaths uh, per conflict. Conflict is measured as uh, anything that has over 1,000 deaths is considered a conflict. Uh, but as you can see, the number of people who are dying in conflicts is actually declining. And uh, um, in this decade, it's, it's once again the civil wars in the orange that are um, that are peaking, but the rest of them are at an all-time low. We are also safer from climate. Uh, Climate-related deaths, which is to say deaths from uh, things, like, uh, um, things like floods and uh, droughts and so forth, have declined dramatically uh, over the last uh, 100 years. And that's partly because increased wealth allows us to build uh, sturdier dwellings, we have better communications, we have satellites which can alert people to an approaching uh, hurricane uh, and what have you. And so we are better prepared and better able to deal with climate related death. Obviously non-climate related death, things like earthquakes and so forth which cannot be predicted, uh, remain at about the same level. Nor is democracy uh, in uh, some sort of a uh, wholehearted retreat. Uh, when communism collapsed, about half of humanity lived under some form of representative government. Today, two-thirds of humanity live under some sort of representative government. And so all of these improvements, all improvements mean that there are many more people today than there were before. Uh, during the Roman Empire, there were about 300 million people in the entire world, which is to say there were as many people in the world as there are Americans today. But today we are fast approaching 8 billion. And the cool thing is that in spite of the population growth, we are not running out of food. So global supply of calories per person per day increased from about 2,200 calories to about 3,000 calories since uh, the 1960s. The FDA recommends 2,000 calorie diet on average. And today, uh, at least theoretically, uh, we have access to uh, globally uh, to about 3,000 calories per person per day. And Sub-Saharan Africa, which is the world's poorest continent, people enjoy access to as many calories as the Portuguese did in the early 1960s.
This is once again a look at the prices of 15 most important and most widely traded commodities around the globe in terms of uh, re relative to work, relative to demand of labor. So think about it this way. If it took you, um, let's, let's take the second one from the top, it's sugar. And as you can see, sugar has declined by about 86% between 1980 and 2018. So over the last 38 years, it declined in price by 86%. But what that really means is that if it took you, say, 10 minutes of labor um, in 1980 to buy a kilogram or a pound of sugar, today it would take you 86% less amount of work in order to, to do that. I like to translate prices not into inflation-adjusted real prices, because the real prices Inflation adjustment doesn't take into account the increase in productivity and therefore increases in compensation. Okay? People make usually more money, unless there is a crisis, unless there is some sort of depression, every year people make more money than is the inflation rate, which is why at the end of our lives we are much richer, working lives, we are much richer than when we begin because we become more productive, right? But real prices don't take into account increases in productivity and increases in uh, income for a person over a lifetime. So by relating prices to, um, by, by relating the availability or affordability of commodities that go into everything. I mean, you can see sugar, you can see pork, you can see salmon, um, you know, you can see palm oil, wheat, and so on and so forth. By translating that into hours of labor, that gives you a much better sense of um, how well humanity is doing. And all of them have declined on average by about 72% over the last 38, 38 years. Now let's turn to COVID um, and talk a little bit about that. Obviously, the country has been going through a very tough time and uh, uh, individuals as well as individually as well as collectively. But I want you to look at um, the time that it took for humanity to identify and then to deal with pathogens that came before us. So we know that smallpox is about three and a half thousand years old. And it really took until 1980 before we eradicated uh, smallpox around the world. Polio is present in Egyptian carvings. Um, it was eradicated last week in Africa, became the last uh, place. Africa was declared uh, polio-free last week. So once again, three and a half thousand years in which humanity had absolutely no idea what polio was, how it worked. Well, you know, people died, but they didn't know what they were dying of. Um, and um, typhoid, two and a half thousand years. Measles, one and a half thousand years. Um, Ebola, 43 years. HIV AIDS doesn't have a vaccine, and it's not on the chart, but it took 15 years from the time that we started talking about HIV AIDS in 1980 until 1995 when the first antiretroviral drugs um, came online and, and people who were HIV positive were able to survive on, on uh, these particular drugs. They had terrible side effects, then they improved, then they became cheaper, and today we have drugs, but we don't have a vaccine. Well, with COVID, it took three months uh, before we started uh, really working on a vaccine, and it may well be, there is no guarantee, but it looks like we are going to have a vaccine within 12 months of first identifying the pathogen. So, you know, these sorts of things are going to happen. We are going to be facing um, viruses as long as humans exist on this planet. Um, the pandemic has alerted us to some serious vulnerabilities in terms of how prepared we are for pandemics. Um, nonetheless, because of human ingenuity, because of tremendous progress that humanity has made in terms of computing, supercomputing, um, uh, medical knowledge and information spread, where we know what works because an Italian doctor or a South Korean doctor can tell us what works. It doesn't take a ship six months to deliver the news. It can be done in six seconds. We are able to learn from each other and we are able to uh, hopefully put this episode to rest very quickly. 
Okay, so the planet has more people who are freer, who live longer, who are better educated, who consume more food, who enjoy higher incomes, who work less, fight less, and have access to more abundant resources. Yet pessimism is everywhere. And this is a quote from uh, my favorite British author, Matt Ridley, who 10 years ago wrote, the bookshops are groaning under ziggurats of pessimism, the airwaves are crammed. I'll need to resort to this, which I thought I didn't have to, but now I do. The airwaves are crammed with doom. In my adult lifetime, I have listened to the implacable predictions of growing poverty, coming famines, expanding deserts, imminent plagues, impending water wars, inevitable oil exhaustion, mineral, mineral shortages, falling sperm counts, thinning ozone, acidifying rain, nuclear winters, mad cow epidemics, Y2K computer bugs, killer bees, sex change fish, global warming, ocean acidification, and even asteroid impacts. I can recall a time when one or other of these scares was not solemnly espoused by sober, distinguished, and serious elites and hysterically echoed by the media. The fashionable reason for pessimism changed, but the pessimism was constant. In the 60s, it was the population explosion and global famine. In the 70s, the exhaustion of natural resources. In the 80s, acid rain. In the 90s, pandemics. In the 2000s, global warming. One by one, these scares came, and all but the last went away. But you cannot tell that from the media and from our politicians. Here is AOC, who asks, in this terrible world, is it still OK to have kids? Here is Greta saying, you have stolen my childhood dreams. Bill Mara, who says, die and stay dead. Bill Nye, the science guy, the planet is on effing fire. And some European scientists suggesting we should start eating each other. So, on what principle is it that with nothing but improvement behind us, we are to expect nothing but deterioration before us, as the British historian Thomas Babington Macaulay has asked in 1830. So here is where I turn to the reasons for pessimism. This is really the second and the last part of my talk. Well, it turns out that uh, pessimism rests in what I will call human hardware, human software, um, and also in the surrounding environment. So let's first look at human hardware. Human beings are constantly bombarded with information. Because our brains have limited computing power, they have to separate that which is important, such as, for example, a dangerous animal running toward us, from that which is mundane, such as, I don't know, a bed of flowers. Because survival is more important than all other considerations for the survival of the organism, most information enters our brain through the amygdala, the part of our brain that is responsible for primal emotions like rage, hate, and fear. So straight from the visual thalamus, information then proceeds to amygdala, which is then connected to our spinal cord and to our nervous system, so that when we see, it, when we see a snake, um, we can immediately jump away. It is only later that information then enters the visual cortex where we can start <clears throat> things like evaluating whether the snake is in fact poisonous or dangerous or whether it is a garden variety snake. But the first is the shock, is the amygdala acting, warning you, you step back, and then later the, the information gathering starts, the, 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 the information processing will determine whether the snake is in fact as as dangerous as we expected to, uh, as we thought it was. Um, so amygdala is always on the lookout for something to fear. And a recent study at McGill University, which um, studied which news stories people chose to read, and what they thought in in what in what people thought was an eye tracking experience, uh, experiment. Now it turns out that even when people say that they want more good news, people are more interested in bad news. 
This, these particular researchers found that regardless of what the participants said, they exhibit a preference for negative news content. So even people who came into the, into the experiment saying, we want to read good news, their eyes on a split screen before them would focus on bad news because that is how we are programmed to be. Let's turn to human software. So, the human brain uh, tends to overestimate danger due to what psychologists call the availability heuristic, or a process of estimating the probability of an event based on the ease with which a relevant instance comes to mind. Now, unfortunately, human memory recalls events for reasons other than their recurrence in real life. When an event turns up because it is traumatic, the human brain will overestimate how likely it is to reoccur. So consider our fear of terror. Since 9-11, one researcher found, seven people per year were killed in the United States by a terrorist. But 300 people die every year in the United States by falling in bathtubs. However, because a terrorist death is much more traumatic than falling in a bathtub, we actually never see anybody falling in a bathtub, whereas we can always bring up the memory of those two airplanes flying into, into, into uh, the, the trade center, that we are much more afraid of terrorism than uh, what is much more likely to happen, which is us falling in a bathtub. Now, people also tend to think in relative as opposed to absolute terms. What matters to us is not an absolute improvement in our own well-being, or for the matter, well-being of other people. But it is our well-being relative to people around us. Our minds have evolved at a time of intense competition for resources and sexual partners within small groups of foraging ancestors. People who obtain disproportionate share of both resources and sexual partners got to pass their genes on to the future. In other words, the success of others does not fill us with happiness, it fills us with dread. So that's another psychological problem that we have to deal with. Yet another one is that bad is stronger than good. If you ask yourself how much happier you could be by leaving this room, you could probably come up with a few things that could happen to you that would make you happier. Maybe you could win a lottery. However, think about how much worse you could feel when you leave this room. Imagine all the horrible things that could befall you and your family to make you miserable. And in reality, the number of ways in which things could go wrong is infinitely greater than the number of ways that we can imagine that things could go right. So, psychological literature shows that people fear losses more than they look forward to gains, dwell on setbacks more than they relish successes, resent criticism more than being encouraged by praise. Bad is stronger than good. Now, a recent uh, finding by Harvard psychologist David Lavari and uh, Daniel Gilbert known as the prevalence-induced concept change, suggests that the rarer something gets, the more broadly we redefine the concept. So that's my next uh, item on the list, widening definition of bad. What do I mean by that? Well, according to the authors, our studies show that when people judge each Sorry, our studies show that people judge each new instance of a concept in the context of previous instances. So what does this academic language mean? It means that as we reduce the prevalence of a problem, such as discrimination, for example, we judge each new behavior in the improved context that we have created. Another way to say it is that solving problems causes us um, another way of, of saying is that solving problems causes us to expand our definition of problems. When problems become rare, our count, we count more things as problems. 
our studies, that is the studies of, of these two academics at Harvard, uh, suggest that when the world gets better, we become harsher critics of it. And this can cause us to mistakenly conclude that it has not actually become better at all. Progress, in other words, seems to mask itself. Another problem is the reminiscence bump. As we grow older, we start recalling more and more stories from our childhood. People tend to develop rosy nostalgia for the days when they were young, when they were virile, uh, full of potential. And by feeling good about the past, dissatisfied with the present and dreading the future, uh, they are really simply superimposing their own uh, physical and mental decline on the rest of the world. Good and bad things happen on different timelines. Uh, there's a basic asymmetry in life between the positive, which is difficult and takes time, and the negative, which is much easier and takes less time. So, for example, compare the socialization of a human being into an adult, which takes many, many years, and then an instance in which you can kill that individual. Think about how long it takes to make an airplane, and then how quickly it takes to destroy it in an airplane crash. We never see a, a newspaper headline saying, um, um, today poverty around the world fell by 300,000 people or so. Um, because tackling of poverty is incremental. It happens over long periods of time in bits and pieces. Whereas a tsunami or an earthquake will wipe out tens of thousands of people in a moment. That is what catches our attention. Um, pessimism uh, reduces expectations, uh, narrowing the gap between um, the possible and the actual outcomes. Uh, expecting that things will get bad is the best way to be pleasantly surprised when they are not. And there's a very, very famous example of Stephen Hawking, the Cambridge University theoretical physicist, who was diagnosed with motor neuron disease at the age of 21 in 1963. In uh, 2004, uh, 40 years later, um, he was asked by a New York Times reporter, why is he so cheerful? And he says, well, uh, my expectations were reduced to zero when I was 21 in 1963, so everything, that, everything since then has been a bonus. And the last thing I want to talk about is uh, what uh, some people refer to as turning point itis, but you could also call it uh, 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 end of history illusion. So, even people who are aware of a lot of progress that has taken place in the past underestimate our ability um, to change in the future. So if you underestimate our ability to adapt from unsustainable situations, you will find all kinds of things that will freak you out. If you extrapolate the CO2 emissions and global warming, or rise in sea levels and flooding, or population growth and food production into the future, um, um, then uh, then, then you can see the future in very dark terms. However, that assumes that we are going to proceed into the future without ever changing our behavior, such as, for example, women having fewer babies, that we are not going to change our behavior in terms of producing more uh, food on uh, the same acreage. It doesn't, it doesn't take into account the possibility that we are going to come up with cleaner sources of, of energy which would be able to supply human needs without CO2 emissions. In other words, turning pointitis or the end of history illusion assumes that we are not intelligent animals who are capable of innovating our, our way out of problems. These people treat humanity as though we are rabbits or some other low form of life who simply um, uh, face nature without any ability to, uh, to alter our surrounding environments. And we can do that because we have intelligence which other uh, animals, uh, most other animals don't have and others possess in lower quantity. 
Finally, I want to talk about human environment, the nature of news. So the nature of cognition and the nature of news interact in ways that make uh, us think that the world is worse than it really is. News is about what happened, things that don't happen go unreported. As Steven Pinker likes to say, uh, we never see a cameraman standing in a peaceful city saying, I'm reporting from a city where civil war has not broken out. Right? So if it bleeds, it leads. So the, the, the way that our brains interact with news, it's in a very toxic sort of um, circle of reinforcement. And of course, social media makes the news more intimate and more immediate. Uh, in the centuries that have gone by, um, you didn't know about most wars and famines and uh, diseases that may have wiped out entire continents. You just wouldn't be aware of it. Now, now you can see it. Uh, now you can see an earthquake, an outcome of an earthquake or a tsunami on your phone as it is happening. And that makes you more vulnerable. Um, because it brings it to you, as opposed to you being ignorant of it. Okay, so what can you do? Well, as you go through life, remember all the different ways in which your mind is playing tricks on you. Recognize that you are a member of a species that's always on the lookout for something to fear. And that you have a predisposition toward the negative, which provides a market for purveyors of bad news, be they doomsayers who claim that overpopulation will cause mass starvation, or scaremongers who claim that we are running out of natural resources. The negativist bias is deeply ingrained in our brains. It cannot be wished away. The best that we can do is to realize that we are suffering from it. The other additional thing that you can do is to buy my book, <laughs> which is doing well on Amazon. Please follow Human Progress on uh, social media or come and visit the website itself. Thank you very much.